So our next speaker will be Alberto Figueroa. He has a joint appointment in biomedical engineering and surgery. And he's going to tell us about advanced computational modeling tools for patient-specific hemodynamic analysis. Alberto. Okay. Morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Sean, and uh, everyone else at MICD for inviting me to, these, to this event. So um, today I'm going to just give you a flavor of uh, some of the work and projects that we have uh, in our lab that are computational in nature. And I will talk also about the tools themselves that we are developing. So a few slides first for um, tools and methods for what we do, which is in a nutshell, data-driven cardiovascular simulation. Uh, so we, we rely very heavily on uh, data uh, that is either clinic or experimentally obtained uh, that has to do with a, the stuff that we are simulating. So this data is going to be fundamentally anatomical data, which is what you see here in the middle. So that's uh, someone's aorta. And then also physical data on, on the quantities of interest for, for the hemodynamic analysis that we do. So these will be either direct measurements on the primary variables, which are velocity and pressure, or more indirect measurements such as perfusion, pulse wave velocity, things like that. And of course, like uh, for any of you guys here, these data are going to come, they're not synchronized, they're not acquired at the same time, so there's some challenges um, associated with using uh, data coming from uh, different circumstances. There's a lot of variability in the body. So we do a lot of uh, software development in, uh, in, in our lab, and this has uh, basically the, the paradigm, the workflow for our Crimson package. Uh, so Crimson is cardiovascular integrated modeling and simulation. So, you know, like in any application, really, you have a series of pre-processing operations, the parallel, uh, massively parallel, um, incompressible uh, flow solver, and then some post-processing techniques. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some uh, pointers about these through, through the talk. But this, you know, this has, this is a busy slide, but it has this series of libraries. We are open sourcing this project at the end of the year, so it has a series of libraries that have to do with uh, pre-processing. You know, we have both a discrete as well as a CAD based uh, paradigm to dealing with the geometry. Uh, we have, um, you know, from an imaging processing perspective, we have the standard ITK, VTK uh, libraries. We have libraries for Kalman filter based data simulation. We have libraries for multi-scale modeling of under conditions, as well as FSI, et cetera, et cetera. So from a modeling perspective, uh, what do you need in order to simulate blood flow in image-based modeling, uh, uh, in image-based models? So I would say there's two things that are really important. Uh, first of all, being able to couple um, models of different resolution together. So this is what this cartoon here illustrates. So, uh, so you're going to have a part of your model that comes directly from image data, which is this guy here. And there you're going to have the highest resolution model, which is 3D in average Stokes. And then, uh, because you don't have enough measurements, that's always the case in the clinic, you can expose the patient to you know, measurement after measurement after measurement. The most uh, efficient or logical way to go about it is to use surrogate models of the circulation that through convenient parameterization can help you bypass the fact that you don't have that data in the first place. And this is what these you know, circles here mean. So in this case, for instance, you have a resistor. A resistor, if you stretch your imagination, is um, kind of like Navier-Stokes. It relates pressure and velocity only in a much simpler way. Navier-Stokes, you have a nonlinear, uh, three-dimensional vector relationship, which is partial differential equations between velocity and pressure. And here you have a single scalar that relates the two. But conceptually, it's the same thing. So likewise, you may have more complicated lamp parameter models or impedance functions, uh, 1D wave models, or even nonlinear one-dimensional models. So we do a lot of this. Um, you see a lot of submissions that rely on uh, fluent, you know, I don't want to name any software, that are basically generic packages. And um, so if you ever come across one of these in your, in your discipline, uh, uh, red flags that uh, tell you that they are not using the right type of tools are what I'm showing here. These are two different papers that are reviewed in the last month. If you look at all these artificially long extensions, you know, you see how every single outflow vessel is extended. Uh, in an idealized manner with cylinders, 
So that basically, in this, this is a pulmonary model, this is an aortic model. This basically shows you that don't, they don't have the right tools to do this 3D reduced order modeling handling. And what they do is they extend that vessel artificially to regularize the flow and not have divergence or numerical instability problems at the outlets. So this will, you know, happens like three quarters of the papers I read, they will have this kind of problem. Um, so together with an appropriate uh, channel to handle you know, multi-scale models, I in the cardiovascular system, it's also very important to deal with uh, fluid structure interactions. So the vessels are not rigid pipes. Uh, it, it turns out that the elastic properties of the vessel are very uh, strongly connected to disease. So uh, people who have hypertension have stiffer vessels than normal. And that is going to affect the physics of the flow there. You know, you're going to have faster pulse wave velocities and, you know, you know, basically the overall dynamics change. So, so one of the things I did for my PhD is to develop a computationally efficient method for a fluid structure interaction uh, in, in these kind of vascular models. That basically, uh, some, sometimes people refer to this approach as a transpiration uh, model. It allows for non-zero velocities at the wall, but you actually don't move the mesh. So it fundamentally relies on having small deformation in those vessels, so you don't have to uh, deal with a heavy problem of changing the geometry potentially over that pulsatile behavior. Um, and, you know, for, for there are many cases where this is not an unreasonable approximation. So this uh, kind of shows you the workflow. So we start with image data. This is one of the biggest models we've ever uh, made. So this is a full body, uh, head to toe CT scan of a person. So we have some uh, image segmentation. Uh, algorithms to um, basically define the vessels of interest. In this case, we had two different CT scans, one for the head and one for the rest of the body. So this is the model. In this case, the model is actually a CAD model. So it's a NURBS, uh, uh, you know, the definition of the geometry is analytical. And um, in many cases, we have to endow this, not only with outflow boundary conditions that I already mentioned briefly, but with tissue properties. So here you have maps of tissue stiffness as well as tissue thickness. And um, so this is kind of the way the physics look like. So here on the left, you have pressure with representative waveforms at 10 different locations. And here you have velocity with representative waveforms at 10 different locations. So this is actually 3D, like I mentioned, uh, and fluid structure interaction. If you look closely here, you're going to see that you know, breathing uh, kind of uh, behavior. Okay? So once you have these, you can, you, know, you can start looking to questions and, and really use this as a, as a tool. The main four applications uh, of this area of work really are these four. So you can really use these things as you would use any other tool to, to get, gain further insight into disease. The FDA, as of 10 years ago, is uh, asking every medical device company to use computation for their design and optimization of devices. So they're moving from the old uh, build and test, uh, trial and error paradigm to virtual test paradigm. Um, uh, another hot topic is to use machine learning, imaging, and modeling to uh, save patients from invasive diagnostic procedures. So here, you're not even doing an operation. You're basically not poking the patient in order to determine whether she or he needs to go A or B. And then the idea of surgical planning, which is very attractive in the sense that maybe you can use physics-based modeling to guide surgeons to choose the optimal procedure for, for a specific so I'm going to give you briefly uh, uh, an example of actual surgical planning. We've done a few uh, since I came to Michigan. Uh, I don't have time to get into super details here, but basically the cardiac surgeon, uh, this was a, a patient that was born with a single ventricle in the heart. So basically these guys experience a lot of plumbing so and reconnection of vessels because their circuit is not normal, so to speak. And this was a 19-year-old girl who came back with additional symptoms. And just to be very brief, from an engineering perspective, this vessel that comes um, uh, up here, um, the objective of the operation that this patient needed is to have the flow from this vessel reach both lungs evenly. Oops. So this is the right lung. It's right pulmonary artery. The right lung would be here. This is the left lung, left pulmonary artery. So right now, it's, it's, it's not too difficult to see that this guy is going to feed the left lung mostly and nothing or if anything, will make it to the right lung. So um, the, the cardiac surgeon told me, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking about two potential ways to do this. One, 
I will remove the vessel from there. I will connect it to this other vessel. This vessel comes up, and then it mixes in this kind of trifurcation, and hopefully it will reach both lungs in an even way. Option number two is, again, I'm going to detach that vessel from there. I'm going to pass it over the aorta to this other vessel. Now the flow will come down this way. And again, hopefully, it will uh, result on a more even distribution. OK. So we basically tried both. There's a, an entire process for parametrization and validation of the preoperative conditions. And it's only when we achieve that, when we match the known preoperative conditions, that we actually play with these virtual post-operative scenarios. So uh, after going through this process, we saw that in this case, option number one would result in 80% going to the right and 20% going to the left, versus option number two that uh, gave a more even 70-30. And not only that, when we looked at these uh, over the entire cardiac cycle on a kind of pseudo-continuous analysis, we see that this solution produces a more even behavior in terms of flow splits. Uh, over the cardiac cycle than this other solution that has, you know, more extreme high and low behavior. So we recommended this option, and they they did it. And what happened is the day of the surgery, uh, so this is before they actually started doing anything. It's kind of a one last sanity check. So what you see here, this is a catheter that has a dye that they use in order to understand flow as they are doing the operation. So this dye is released in the vessel of interest. And sure enough, what you can see is that then this vessel, uh, the content of this vessel goes to that one lung exclusively. We already knew this, but that was one last time that we were checking. So what they did is they follow our preoperative suggestion, which is the second one. The vessel goes up this way. And this is the way the vessel ends up looking after the procedure. And then they do the same kind of verification. They insert the catheter with the dye, and now the dye goes up. And you can see how it reaches both lungs. Uh, in, in, a, in a way that, at least from a qualitative perspective, matches these. You can see more contrast, more dye making it to this lung than to this lung. And remember, before that lung had zero. So um, this patient had a big improvement because if you achieve that, if you achieve an a, a even distribution of that uh, flow, uh, things improve, basically. So we're very happy to see that. So now, um, now that I gave you like a case study of how these tools can be quote unquote useful in the clinic. I'm just going to go back to the simulation part and, uh, and you know, this will be the kind of the main focus of, the, of today's talk. So um, everyone in this field, I would say 99% of the work that people do, there is a fundamental assumption which is periodicity. If you look at that first movie that I show of the full body, the waves, the physics that we are calculating, uh, they have a periodic behavior cycle to cycle periodic behavior. The surgical planning uh, that I just did is cycle to cycle periodic behavior. In fact, the cardiovascular system is many cases it doesn't behave in a cycle to cycle periodic. It's a wonderful system of control. There's a lot of mechanisms that allow for adjustments depending on a number of circumstances. So um, you have mechanisms that are global controllers. Um, you know, the, the biggest one is called the barrel reflex. So they literally sense pressure through uh, a series of uh, stretch sensing cells here on the top of the arch and in the, in the uh, carotids, which are on each side of your neck. This stretch sensing is a surrogate of pressure. It's connected to the vasomotor center in the brain. And then the vasomotor center, if it senses changes in pressure, it tells different parts of the circulation what to do. For example, if there's a drop in pressure and you're going to faint, the vasomotor center is wired to your heart, and it tells your heart, hey, you better start pumping harder and faster so your pressure brings back up. Okay? So in addition to this global traffic controller, so to speak, uh, that needs a central computer, you have a series of local um, uh, s special circulations that have their own set of rules. And not surprisingly, these are the brain, the kidneys, and the heart, so the coronary arteries that feed the heart. And um, in any case, if you look at the flow and pressure relationship in these vascular beds, it always looks like this kind of um, sigmoidal function where you have a, a, a branch, kind of a, a flat behavior, and then another branch. So this basically means that these beds are trying to, over a very wide range of pressures, keep flow constant. It's obviously when you make it too low or too high that the system is not able to keep that constancy and flow anymore, and then you, you start going up this branch or, or this branch. 
you can see that in all cases, they kind of have similar shapes. Yeah. So uh, today I'm going to focus about, I'm, I'm going to be focused on the coronary, uh, vessels that feed the heart. Okay, so a little bit of uh, physiology knowledge here. So, um, you know, the heart is the pump that uh, sends blood millions and millions of times through your lifetime to the rest of the body. And uh, it's highly adaptable. So right now, we are all resting. We have a, a flow rate of about five liters per minute. But if we started running uh, very fast, these can go up to a factor of four, 20 liters per minute. And the pressure is not going to go up by a factor of four, because otherwise we would all drop dead. So there is a very uh, efficient and dynamic change of pressure so that in the presence of a large increase in flow, pressure remains not constant, but fairly constant. Okay? So this is achieved through different mechanisms. In the case of the coronaries, we have a mechanism that is uh, feed forward in nature. So basically, the central nervous system, when you are on your marks about to run, you're actually, it's like if you're very hungry and you see a nice steak, if you are a, a carnivore. You kind of get ready for it. You know that you're going to change and something is going to change. So that's going to help you with the transition. So this is one type of, uh, of control. And the other one is once the perturbation actually st uh, starts, it relies on control theory basis, which is an error signal. So you have a certain demand, and you have to be able to supply it. And this, um, you know, it's, it's basically oxygen. You need to be able to provide oxygen to the working muscles of the heart and the body. And there are several mechanisms that affect that. So uh, how do you go about modeling that? So you need to understand the anatomy. So in terms of the anatomy, you have vessels that leave the aorta that are on the surface of the heart, the bigger vessels. They are called epi because they are in the periphery, epi, epicardial vessels. And then you have vessels that kind of go into the muscle and eventually go to the capillary level that uh, reach the cells. So uh, what's known from a, from a biology perspective is that uh, there is different mechanisms of control for different vessels. So for the larger vessels, there is a fit forward, again, doesn't rely on error signal mechanism, for the bigger vessels. That maybe in a counterintuitive way, what it does is it stiffens the vessel. Okay? You, wouldn't, you would think that maybe this is not the best to uh, increase flow, but actually it kind of is because uh, you need to remember that these vessels are embedded in the heart and they can be squeezed. So if you want to optimize flow delivery, you don't want them to collapse. So in this way, you manage to do that. It's a alpha vasoconstriction, so it stiffens the vessel, constricts a little bit, but it's not going to constrict any further. Now, uh, for the intermediate size vessels, you have something that you, you think is more intuitive, which is if you want to maximize flow delivery, you need to be able to dilate. And that happens in the smaller vessels here. So it's, again, a feed forward. And then, obviously, at the tissue level, you're going to have the feedback response, where you are checking whether you are supplying enough or not. And that's going to be also vasodilation. So this is what is known uh, from a biology perspective. So you can rely on reduce order models to basically come up with peripheral, medium, feed forward, feedback corresponding to the different parts. You know, you kind of get the idea here. And now the question is, how do these things actually happen? And this is where one of my postdocs, who is a mathematician, he ha he's no bias by biology, so he came up with a model just by having very mathematically unbiased observations of measurements. And this is what it is. So first of all, he said, okay, let's assume that the system somehow tries to minimize oxygen debt, which is a very reasonable assumption. The system is going to change so that you manage to supply stuff to the, to the muscle. So he designs, he defined this hunger. Okay, instantaneous hunger, which is the difference between the demand and the supply. So the supply is proportional to the flow rate that you manage to get into the system. Of course, the system, no system, no reasonable control system will have as a goal to have instantaneous matching. You can go into a little bit of a debt and, and overcoming. Otherwise, it's just not efficient. So the primary variable is actually this capital H, which keeps track of the history of debt. Okay? And then the question is, how can I write a model that allows me to uh, mm, you know, represent how the vessels are going to respond in order to uh, keep these to zero. So, and he basically uh, was inspired by this experiment, which is already quite old. So in this experiment, what they did is they took a dog's heart and they separated the root of the aorta from the ventricle. What happens is then the perfusion pressure drops substantially, 
And then this is the response of the coronary flow to it. Coronary flow obviously is going to try to, they say, oh my god, we are not being perfused, so we're going to drop our resistance as much as we can so that we maintain flow. There is only a limit that they can manage to, to do that. But he, he looked at that and he told me, Alberto, I think that looks like a second order damp harmonic oscillator to me. I'm like, okay, go, go with it. So he basically, on this variable, he said, I'm going to have the dynamics of it follow the second order damped harmonic oscillator. So he does a little bit of algebra. He defines S as being the inverse of the resistance, which is what you are controlling. And he came up with this relationship. And what was really nice, and, and the you know, people in the, in the biology journal that we submitted this to really appreciated, is the fact that with this model, independently, he managed to obtain terms that are fit back in nature, but also fit forward in nature. So it really kind of matches what was known from a biology perspective. Yeah? All right, so we have a model. This is what we all do here. How do you implement it? So in our, in our software, we have uh, developed tools so that you can do these kind of things uh, with relative ease. So first of all, we have a graphical user interface uh, that uses the netlist uh, protocol where you can literally draw your circuits. Okay, so this is kind of the whiteboard that pops up, and you're going to be able to draw any circuit that is relevant to your purposes as an outflow condition for your vessels. You have all these um, ingredients, so to speak, the connection with the 3D phase, then resistors, inductors, capacitors, valves, etc. And this is kind of the idea. So it's a GUI-based specification, um, and and you know this is the interfacing with the actual C++ and Fortran libraries. So the idea is that you can have any reduce order model without ever having to compile the code, yeah. which is a desirable thing. In addition to this, you also need to have some broadcasting capabilities. So one part of your model, for example, this is the, an idealized coronary, knows about other part of your model, and this is the hard model. So the hard model and the coronary model need to talk to each other, and your, your simulation framework needs to be able to handle that. So let's look at the results. So this is the kind of data that you get outside the US. Um, so this is a patient that was uh, pedaling on a bike for half an hour with a catheter down its coronary artery. This experiment, it would be nearly impossible to perform here. This was done at my previous institution in the UK. And what you see here is two things. Um, so this is the recording of pressure in that coronary vessel. Uh, it looks like a very thick line because it's a pulsatile signal. So it's systole, diastole, so you're seeing the range. And, um, and so what you see is that, you know, over the course of these 20 minutes or so, the patient's uh, pressure goes up, and then it kind of plateaus, and then when you tell the patient to stop, it goes down. So this is data over 20 minutes plus. Oops. The, this curve here is heart rate. So heart rate at every instance, you know, heart rate obviously, or in general, goes up and then it goes down. So what our model takes as input are things that you could measure actually non-invasively. And that input is this blue line, which is the systolic value, the maximum value. You could measure it with a cuff. And then heart rate, certainly you can also measure non-invasively. So with this, and with the model that I presented to you, these are the results. So um, flow, which is what we use to compare our predictions, uh, so the red line is the data, okay? Again, over those 20 minutes, you see the same similar pattern. It goes up, pl plateaus, and then it goes down. Uh, this is what our model predicted uh, with these inputs, the, the, the green line here. If you didn't have a model, if your model was static, this is what you would get. Because you do have an increase in driving pressure, which is your input, you will have a mild increase in flow just because you have a higher driving pressure. But it's nowhere near enough to explain what you actually see in the patient. So you need dynamic adaptation. And this is the relative changes in the quantity that we are controlling, which is the resistance. So resistance goes down uh, to, to accommodate more flow. Okay? And these are the basically just an animation of the three-dimensional results. Um, so further comparison between our simulation and, and the measurements. Uh, this is Doppler uh, velocities on that coronary vessel in the early part of the exercise. That's data, and that's our simulation. The thing to note here is the frequency and the range, uh, because these are three-dimensional simulations, obviously. Uh, and what you see here is later in the exercise where the heart rate is much faster and the flow is higher, you see the you know, higher frequency in the data as well as the 
bigger range that, that tells you that there's more flow going down that way. So, uh, you know, we, we're really interested in this. We, we are getting into, into scenarios where, in order to be predictive, we think that it's important that your model has the capability of uh, looking at transitional situations. This happens when you have a hemorrhage. This happens in all of these vascular beds. This happens when you are undergoing surgery where you have constant variations in anesthesia level and, you know, the system is not static, basically. There's a lot of things we don't know about it. Uh, every person will have a patient-specific auto-regulation response. So that response, again, will have parameters of its own that need to be estimated, of course. Uh, the more sophisticated your tools are, the more sophisticated the data you need. Uh, but, you know, that's the story of our life, right? Uh, so. So this is the website of, uh, of our package, Crimson. And again, we are shooting for November to, to open source it. Um, additional features that uh, we are currently working on are more sophisticated, uh, string energy-based, nonlinear uh, constitutive models, um, ALE, uh, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian based methods for fluid structure interaction. Here we do have to move the mesh and stuff, obviously more computationally expensive. Um, you know, more advanced imaging features, and we're also working on uh, having a GUI-based, um, you know, Python-based uh, advection diffusion reaction interface so we can simulate transport of species, uh, drugs, or even proteins in blood uh, interacting with each other. So um, the one thing that we are almost nearly done with it is that we have these uh, already, we have a prototype where the flow solver works on AWS, Amazon Web Services. So we, we develop a, do a Docker container for the flow solver uh, so that you know, anyone on a, on a clinical setting uh, that doesn't have an HPC will not have to A, compile uh, you know, a rather complicated uh, parallel incompressible flow solver in hardware-specific libraries. And they will have a you know, use it as you need it kind of model. So the American Heart Association uh, is really pushing for uh, you know what they call the precision medicine platform. So we're trying to implement this in in their in their kind of space. Um, yeah. So these are just acknowledgments and thank you for your attention. Yeah, I was wondering, you mentioned that uh, the blood vessel stiffness is, uh, you need to know that to predict the blood blood flow. This is an important physics. But, but do you have any way of measuring that? How do you deal with, with stiffness? And, yeah. and why do people with hypertension have stiff blood vessels? OK, so two great questions. So, uh, so you can measure the, the constitutive behavior of a vessel is nonlinear. So it has a nonlinear stress-strain relationship. So to define the nonlinear behavior, you will need to have invasive testing, which is not possible in humans, but you use animal models for that. So you will be able to measure biaxially, you know, uh, pressure diameter, stretch uh, force, and, and that will allow you to characterize the parameters of a nonlinear. Uh, you can do it non-invasively, and that will give you a linearized behavior around a point. And for that, you need to have information on the distensibility as well as uh, knowledge on pressure. So if you have pressure and distensibility around that particular value, you will be able to find the linearized, uh, the linear model uh, best fit of the nonlinear behavior at that point. Oh, you can do it with MRI or with Doppler. So you need a, a dynamic imaging technique that will give you, uh, you know, multiple frames per second and you basically get to see the, pulsa the pulsation on the vessel itself. Yeah. And then uh, your second question is obviously very loaded, but you can basically, uh, one of the biggest drivers of remodeling is pressure. So if your pressure goes up, uh, it sends a series of signals to the vessel wall and uh, constituents, you know, fibroblasts, smooth muscles and stuff become more active or less active. And they're going to lay more uh, fibers that are going to make the wall thicker, for instance. And even if there's no material change, if you still have the same building blocks, having a thicker wall makes for a structurally stiffer structure 
that is going to affect the physics globally. So that's a very accelerated answer to your question. Okay, other questions? My question was actually somewhat related to what Saul asked about. How close are you to personalized medicine, to taking your toolkits and getting just a few non-invasive parameters from a person in a quick way and being able to model their particular uh, challenges for whatever issue they're having? So there are uh, commercial uh, examples where that is happening already. Um, in order to do it, I, I think it's very nearly impossible to do it in an academic setting. Uh, it's, it's about producing a, a, a workflow that is highly optimized, you know, an industrial uh, kind of workflow. Um, but there are examples of that um, that, you know, uh, maybe not too surprisingly, they have actually rather simple models because they, they don't have a lot of room for concept, conceptual complexity. The number of data, the, the type of data that you get from the clinic is also very limited. So these, these, these are examples of the simplest model that can give you an answer, optimized in an industrial way. So it, it, there are examples already, and you know the, the boundary keeps uh, getting pushed. So I think we'll see more of this. I'm just curious, uh, these, ty these simulations you showed, how long do they take to run and what's the type of the data it produces, like how, how large is that data, um, how many processors do you need, uh, and so forth? Yeah, so it, it's difficult to give a, a very simple answer because it of depends course, on yeah, the problem. Yeah. Uh, what we do here routinely are maybe 100 to 200 cores um, for two, three days. Yeah. Uh, you know, that will give you that will give you, uh, 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 you know, data that, you know, again, it depends on the size of the mesh, but we usually produce 50 to 100 frames over the, the representative periodic behavior. So, you know. The reason I ask is when you're talking about open source software, uh, you can imagine someone at another location that's interest, that has an idea for a model, but they don't have the resources or the students to take this software run it on 200 cores, generate the data, and then test their model. So having open source data as well, where it's expensive. I mean, it, it, the model might have to test a three-dimensional time-dependent flow, and you don't know a priori which variables they care about. So you might need that data for every flow field. Um, but if that was available to someone to test a model on, I imagine that'd be very useful. Yeah, I mean, this is what the AHA, the American Heart Association, is doing. They're, they're trying to uh, develop, a, what they call it a walled garden. It's like a safe, you know, data protection, patient con confidentiality is a big deal. But they're trying to, to create a safe space where not only tools but also data are available under certain uh, circumstances. And you could do things like the ones you are describing. Cool. Any other questions? Let's thank Alberto again. Thank you.